All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Microdesk and AI, how we're using AI to change the industry. My name is Jess. I'm the event coordinator here on Microdesk. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, not in the chat panel. Also, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our website and YouTube channel within a couple of days. Um, you'll be receiving an email with a link when it's available. And before we jump into the webinar, I just want to introduce Microdesk to you all. So Microdesk was founded in 1994 as an Autodesk reseller with a simple mission to assist architecture, engineering, construction, owners, and GIS firms with improving workflows and integrating project delivery technologies. 25 years later, and that mission still holds true. Microdesk is a well-established AECO consulting firm with 13 offices in the US and UK. We have over 300 professionals and over 230 AECO consulting specialists and software developers that can help in all sectors, all disciplines, and all stages. Some of the hottest topics in the AECO world are globalization, urbanization, and sustainability. Urbanization studies suggest that the U.S. will build 114 cities the size of Boston in the next 30 years. Here at Microdesk, we can help to make sure you're prepared to meet those demands. We use software from industry leaders and combine it with our vision and passion for sustainability to meet the demands of urbanization and globalization. Our team of industry expert consultants are redefining project delivery and asset management. We're committed to helping clients realize the business benefits of BIM quickly and economically by facilitating the use of innovative technologies and processes. Whether it's streamlining your design, construction, or operations, our consulting team is the nation's largest and most experienced group of AECO technology consulting professionals. Microdesk's clients represent some of the nation's most well-respected organizations and public agencies, including the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Denver Airport, and Columbia University, amongst many others. To help support the industry with these demands of urbanization, we provide full-service consulting. This includes building information modeling services, technology management, mentoring and support, and much, much more. We partner with world leaders such as Autodesk and IBM to utilize innovative technologies and methodologies to empower sustainable design and overcome local challenges. Our vision is to reduce the environmental impact of urbanization by helping the AECO industry to design, construct, and operate better projects more efficiently by leveraging the full potential of BIM, BDC, and asset management. Um, now, Jeff Chen, and George Bromet will jump on to take you through today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, this, this is Jeff Chen. And uh, um, so I'm so glad you guys uh, joined my and our, our webinar. So here's a quick introduction for myself. Um, so currently, I'm the asset, uh, um, the, the EAM assistant the director. Um, working on a charge in Microdesk. And uh, um, I used to be a structure engineer for, uh, for a couple of years and uh, uh, doing the BIM management for, uh, for the government agency for the private sectors. And I gained some experiences in the sustainable design, uh, the lead tracking, the lead design, the green building design. And uh, because I, I did my PhD in the uh, asset management, so eventually I, I jumped back into the enterprise asset management and start to think about from a higher level um, uh, so how we can how we can leverage and streamline the data uh, starting from the design to, to construction commissioning and all the way to the operation to to uh, implement a a real truly life cycle project delivery and uh, I'm going to give the mic to George. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm George Broadbent. I'm the VP of Asset Management for Microdesk. Uh, a lot of my background is in enterprise systems deployment um, and most notably, you know, information management, uh, which is, which honestly, you know, 20 years ago was um, was a struggle. 
you know, it was really hard to manage structured and unstructured data and understand what all the key uh, key fields were, the key drivers were. It's a lot of uh, a lot of manual work, a lot of Excel work, a lot of you know database work. And it's it's really good to be here today to talk about artificial intelligence because it's making the job of data managers, um, information management, a lot easier. Um, there is a there's quite a bit of work that happens up front, um, but the end result is much more accurate and much more sustainable. So we're really, you know, looking at you know a new era here. You know, the you know as I talked about twenty some odd years ago, it was difficult to manage all the data. We didn't have a lot of data back then, but it was difficult to manage that data back then. Um, but really. If you kind of look at you know the, where organizations' focus was, you know it was on products, products and services. 2000s was a very heavily uh, noted by you know services, um, Six Sigma, and you know so forth. And then, but then in the, in the 2010s we became you know very customer centric. But now we're really going into an age of data. The and and the the challenge with that is that the amount of data that we're we're managing is, I mean, it's already too much for, for people to manage. Um, so we need bigger systems, smarter systems, and that's really where a lot of AI systems is going to help us in managing all of this information that we're going to be, continue to be inundated with uh, as we go forward. So the agenda for today is, um, is, is pretty straightforward. You know, we're, we'll talk a little bit about what AI is, is always an AI primer. Um, how we use the, the Watson AI platform, visual insights, what that is, predictive maintenance, digital trends, and then a couple of our products, Arid and Ask Alex. And then we'll, we'll touch on a, a humanitarian application for AI. The, um, the agenda here is, um, streamlined for the time that we have together. There are a lot of details, deep details that we're, that we're not going to dive into today. Um, there's also a lot of areas that we, that we could probably structure the second session for everybody where we get into things like construction and uh, how AI is being used in construction. But today we're going to really focus on a lot of engineering and operations and, and how our AI systems are helping uh, those two specific areas. So what is AI? You know, what is it that we are um, talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence? And unfortunately, this is the view that people have had for a very long time. And it's a little scary. You know, where the machines are coming, they're going to take over the world, and they're going to um, kill us all. So, luckily, since, you know, since Terminator came out, the world's view of AI has changed. And it's no longer this menacing thing, um, although there are some cautionary tales out there. Um, but really, AI is everywhere. Um, and it's a very uh, bright future with AI. And we have to look at how things like um, our military flying, um, how we use it for you know, spam filtering alone in our email systems. I mean, that, that, sit, that alone saves us you know, probably you know, hours, if not days, of you know, trying to um, clean out our mailboxes. Um, you know, using it for security and surveillance networks. Um, it really can help us in our everyday life. And in terms of engineering and operations, there's, it's not only the, the value add of, of the system helping us, but it's also, it also can save us money. It can make our facilities and operations much more efficient. Um, and efficiency then translates more into you know, the goals of sustainability, urbanization, um, and globalization. So artificial intelligence, 
it's broken down into many different layers. Um, artificial intelligence, so it, it's how a machine solves problems like, like a human can do. Um, it's really mimicking uh, human reasoning in, in an artificial system. And then a subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning. So machine learning is all about algorithms. You know, sometimes you've heard about how algorithms are constructed, what, you know, is there a bias in algorithms? These are the algorithms that, that people put together to teach the machine how to reason. Um, and then further driving down the, down the line here is artificial neural networks. So, um, you know, these are the, the machine models and they mimic again how the human brain works. Um, all of this is meant to understand understand the world, understand the data that, that the machines are dealing with, and to try and make them reason like we would. Humans are very adaptable to changing circumstances, and we want our AI systems to be adaptable as well. Uh, and then deep learning is the subset of machine learning. Um, so that combines the artificial neural networks and the machine algorithms to build a hierarchy of data. And you'll see, you'll see us talk more about that in terms of hierarchies, decision trees. These are kind of the key things that drive AI systems. So the algorithms that we talk about, you know, the, the main ones that we have been uh, working with is um, a few of these here. So um, you'll see the XGD classifier at the bottom there towards the end of the presentation and how we use that. Um, but the, the key thing to take away here is that each one of these classifiers, these algorithms, builds a decision tree. So how does it get to a positive end result? And what are the decisions that have to be made or what are the choices that can be made to get to that positive end result? And a lot of these different uh, algorithms have are able to run multiple decision trees at the same time, comparing lots of different variables, lots of different um, scenarios all at once, and then coming up with a reasonable uh, decision. Um, and then those decisions are um, compared to the baseline models, which are then used to say I was right or I was wrong. And if it was wrong, then that branch of the tree it's discarded until you get to a positive result. That's that's a very um, simplistic view of of how the algorithms work. Um, you know, we we can get into more details uh, a little bit later on. So the key part of an AI system beyond the algorithms, beyond how they work, is training. Um, you have to teach an AI system what is the correct decision and what is an incorrect decision. So it starts off with data collection and data preparation. Um, data preparation can be very complicated. Um, you have to tag the data elements as to what, um, so that the, that the AI system can start to understand it, or the machine learning model can start to understand it. And then it goes into a training model and a, and a validation process. And this is a um, this is a cyclical process. This is a process by which um, the you will you will teach you will you will upload a data, set of data. You will uh, say these are the correct answers, and then the machine will say, "Okay, I think I understand what you're talking about." And then when you give it new scenarios, it says. Okay, based upon what you showed me, is this a correct answer? And you'll say yes or no. And then if you say no, and you correct it, and you say no, this is the correct answer, it goes back into that training model. And it's this cyclical loop that will eventually teach the AI system to start to learn on its own and understand what is a correct and incorrect answer. All of this takes a lot of data. There is there's just a tremendous amount of data that feeds into an AI system to make it understand what a positive or negative answer is. Um, 
and and then oh, the ultimate goal then is the client front end deployment, and then we're able to give it um, tasks to predict. So scenarios: if this happens, what do you think the outcome will be? So this leads us into um, the IBM Watson platform, which is really our key tool that we use for understanding uh, or you building AI systems. So a lot of times you'll remember Watson from you know Jeopardy. Um, it is you know the I think the all-time smartest contestant uh, on Jeopardy. The um, the thing to understand about Watson is that it's really it's not a single entity. It's not like Skynet. Um, it is a it's more of a family. It is a um, a lot of cousins and brothers and sisters where uh, they're all learning new things, but they're not interconnected with each other. Um, and that's where that's where we come into play you know, in terms of microdesk, in that we have we have data models and we have data sets, so we can effectively, when you, when you, when we go ahead and deploy a Watson system, you know, for customer A, that uh, that system doesn't know anything, and then we deploy a system for customer B, that system doesn't know anything, but we have data sets that we can upload into those, effectively transferring the brain that we have into customer A and customer B's system, so that um, they, they sort of wake up and they are, they know, they start to learn, you know, they understand the world and they understand, you know, what's, what the current task is. Um, and then really the power of AI in Watson is allowing you then to start to unlock those new business values and really start to um, maximize, mox, maximize operational efficiencies, um, launch new business models, enhance the customer experience, a lot of times people will see now on when you go to a website, there is a little chatbot that pops up. Many times those things are powered by AI systems, trying to understand your questions, understand your sentiments. Um, and so that really starts to enhance the experience of the customers. Um, so Watson is composed of um, a module, it's a modular system. So there's the knowledge catalog. That was kind of the brain that I was talking about, um, where we can we can upload information into the system and, and start to um, give it a head start so you don't have to train the system from scratch. Watson Studio is just really that. It's a it's a like a visual studio platform. It's a it's a development environment to build your new your algorithms. Um, there is obviously the machine learning component to it. And then open scale just really means it's the it's the back end um, that allows the system to scale up. Um, it allows you to develop the um, key performance indicators. It allows you to build your dashboards. All of this is um, built into the Watson platform, and it's probably the number one reason why we we like working with it so much because it really gives us a lot of flexibility in how we approach uh, problems that have to be solved. So visual insights is our next area, and this one here is is really um, it's a kind of a fascinating area to me because what we're doing is we're teaching the the um, AI system how to recognize imagery. So that can be video, that can be still images, and really understand how um, how we see the world. So, you know, and a lot of the, the use cases that you'll see here are, um, you know, where we, we physically put somebody in place, physically put somebody out there in the world um, to do an inspection. Maybe it's a dangerous job, they have to climb a tower. Um, but now we can fly a drone around, we can drive a car over pavement, we can collect the imagery, and then the AI system can analyze those, those images. And, they can do it with incredible accuracy. Um, again, there's a lot of data that goes into um, training these systems, but it gives the, the people on the ground um, the ability to review the information 
and um, and refine the models uh, as you go. The um, key thing is here that we can do uh, lots of inspections a lot faster than we could by deploying somebody in the field. Um, so if you wanted to inspect something twice in one day, it may not physically be possible by putting a person out there, but we can fly a drone twice a day out there and see for look for changing conditions. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility, and it also allows us to, to use the um, use the field engineers, field staff, in a very targeted manner. So if we if we say if let's say something comes back and it's it's an, it's not um, it's not 100% certain as to what it is, we can target that field person and say, okay, you need to go take a closer look at this and, and tell us what's going on. So this is one of the applications that we built um, for a uh, for a customer that owns a lot of roadways. Um, and the, the the interesting thing, and we we've modified some of the imagery just for the for presentation purposes, but it is that we you, know, you drive the roadway looking for defects, and then that would have been given to to a firm. They review the data, spend a long time, a couple of months maybe reviewing the information, classifying the information. Uh, so here we can take thousands of images at a time, upload it into the, into the AI application, and um, it will come back within a few seconds or minutes with all of that data classified, and then give you also a map as to where all the defects occurred. So the idea is that um, it, it's looking at the roadways, it's looking at the imagery, it's saying this is a crack, this is a pothole, classifies them, understands from the metadata where that defect occurred, plots it on a map. Now the owner has the ability to say, okay, this is the this is the first pass on our you know 200 miles of roadway. They can then hand that to an engineering firm and, and have their services targeted at you know where the defects are and now start to quantify where the where the defects are occurring. Um, and again because we can process this imagery so much faster, instead of doing these kind of inspections once or twice a year, you could now drive the roadway literally every month, every week, and look for changing conditions. Not that roads change that, that fast, but the concept is the same, that anything that has changing conditions, we can now start to process those images much, much faster. So again, you know, Kind of an example here in manufacturing is that when you have um, a set of imagery, a set of uh, products being being created, the visual system can scan those products in real time as they're coming off the assembly line and look for the defects. When it comes to something that is uh, ambiguous, it can identify the ambiguity, pass it off to a human to say. Was this a defect or is this just something that is passable? That gets that gets uploaded back into the model, retrained, and then the next round of results is that much better, um, that much more accurate. And this can also be applied to um, con, you know uh, semiconductor manufacturing as well. And you know these are these are areas these are these are systems that are very small scale, they are highly complex, they are um, areas, and, and the speed of manufacturing is such that humans can't keep up with tracking these kind of defects. So that's where the, the visual insights um, comes into play and really starts to um, improve the manu overall manufacturing process. So again, you know, just you know, in terms of our capabilities here, you know, cognitive image processing algorithms. Um, we can help you classify okay and no good parts, positive, negative parts. Um, we can do rapid image processing. If you need, you know, real time image processing, we can do that you know, by deploying systems at the edge. Um, we can also deploy it as a SAS model, which is what that pavement management system was deployed as. Um, and then, you know, 
um, we can create and manipulate the the algorithm to update and uh, accommodate for changing conditions, um, and then imp implement a, a feedback loop for um, defect recognition. And then the 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 last section I'll touch on here before I hand it off to Jeff is um, predictive maintenance. So this one is another area here where we can we can start to look at really how we can proactively assign um, what an asset is, how it should be maintained, and understand what the future state will be based upon uh, what has happened to it in the past and what has happened to similar equipment in the past. So really the the whole idea behind pre predictive maintenance um, is understanding what the conditions are. So there's there's a lot of data that comes in on the left-hand side that gets fed into the Watson platform uh, into an IBM Maximo system, which is, again, one of those systems that we predominantly use. Um, we can then look at you know reliability, performance, efficiency, um, safety. We can look at all these different factors. Again, there's a lot of data that's coming in, a lot of data that has to be analyzed, and a lot of dimensions of data that can be uh, that need to be analyzed as a part of this process. So really, you know, again, you know, we start to also combine the vision systems with the predictive components, and that we can really start to say, um, I, I took a picture of this transformer, I took a picture of this piece of equipment, and the AI system can can identify what the what the differences are, or if those changes are um, going to negatively impact the performance of the equipment. Um, and then that gets combined with all of the sensor data into one clear picture of what the future performance will be. And really, this you know this this kind of a system is is aggregating data from you know one or more building management systems. It's really pulling all that information together, pulling the information in from sensors, it's pulling information in from inspections, um, and it's pulling information in from photographs. And lots of dimensions of data that we're analyzing uh, to come up with, a, with an outcome. And so when we look at the, the journey, you know, so we talk about um, managing it. So operations and maintenance, IBM Maximo system, um, and then we connect it to sensors. Uh, we start to look at um, what the performance is through the monitoring. And then once we have, again, more data and we have a history of information, we can start to predict what those in, what that is. And then we can go into an optimization process. And, you know, really the, the goal of predictive asset maintenance is to be able to drive down maintenance costs and reduce breakdowns. Um, if you are able to keep equipment running efficiently and have it not break down, that goes towards you know reducing your overall energy footprint, reducing your carbon footprint, and you know promoting overall sustainability. So again, you know another view here. Um, of looking at you know how we get to um, go from you know a traditional break fix to a predictive model, and so with that I will um, I will now turn it off to turn it over to Jeff um, for the the second half of the presentation. All right, thank you, George. Okay, so uh, the first topic I want to talk about is the digital twin here. So digital twin is a very broad concept in our industry, and it's actually not um, it's not directly coming from our ACO industry. It's that we borrow it from the from the aerospace. Um, so NASA used it many many years ago when they do the moon landing project. Uh, they have this digital twin to to it's a digital replica of the moon landing car. So actually now we are using it, and uh, when people say we're not doing uh, the rocket science, I'm going to say no. Um, so digital twin, I say it's a very broad concept because um, uh, we have this idea that, okay, so now we're going to have this digital twin to replace some of our old things 
um, uh, if you're BIM, um, you're familiar with BIM or, or you work in this BIM world, you know we have the ROD um, um, 300, 400, 500, and we also have the uh, BIM, BIM, 3, uh, BIM dimension, like BIM 3D, 40, 50, 70, uh, 60, 70, HD for a terminology, like for sustainability, for asset management, that's a 70. And when we try to explain this thing to owner or to the yeah to the facility uh, facility owner like a, a airport terminal i said this is a um uh, it's a bin 70 project and uh, the model you receive now is the um, rod um 500 and that confused them and said okay so why okay so i need to search my my vocabulary my dictionary to check what's the meaning of rod 500 means and nowadays the because we are highlighted on the data, we more and more realize the importance of the data. So the ROD is not the level of detail anymore, it's the level of development. And they, they, they even create a, a formula for the ROD is the level of development equals to a level of detail plus level of information. So ROD equals to ROD plus ROI. And it makes the story more complicated. And, and we just, okay, so why we just use the digital twin? And uh, we just tell the owner, this is your digital twin, this is your digital replica of the built asset, and whatever you have it over there, we have it here, and we can open so many possibilities and future uh, future um, future channels to connect to other platforms, and you can do all kinds of um, analysis reporting things I'm going to show you later. So anyway, digital twin will be the, and I think it's becoming the, the common language right now in the AECO when you're talking about the s model, uh, the first question I will ask the owner is why you need SBIM model. Um, here again, the SBIM model is very uh, BIM specific uh, terminology. Uh, we, when we uh, develop our project, we have design model, give it to construction, they do a construct model, and by the end, the, the, the owner may require a SBIM model, which is SBIM. So um, most of the owner doesn't know why they, they need a, and the SBIM model is a true story because they the, the industry is doing this and we sh we're supposed to do this and we need to have the SP model and uh, put it in some repository and waiting for the next big renovation 20 or 30 years ago <clears throat> or, no, 20 or 20 or 30 years later. And um, it's not that, um, 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 it's not the, the way the owner think it, it's, it's going to be because during the 20 or 30 40 years of operation and maintenance, the building changed a lot inside. <clears throat> and uh, uh, um, when you're doing the, the renovation or some project many, many years ago, you cannot just dig out a very out-of-date model and give it to the architecture or the designer and say, this is s model. It's not s at all. Uh, it's only the s during that time, uh, time stamp at that time. So here, uh, what we what should we really care about is digital replica first of the build asset, as the name implies, and also, it can synchronize between your physical asset and, and its digital twin. So here, the synchronized, I mean all the asset informations, the attributes, the parameters, and all the data, data information supposed to be synchronized in between your data dictionary, no, your, uh, your, your, your digital twins and your CMMS, uh, no matter you use SAP or use Maximo or whatever. So, and later on, the digital twin can become a, a central hub or a platform that connects to all the channels, connect to the to the business intelligence, connect to your uh, to your AI platform, connect to your even your Excel to your current to workflow. Compared to you have a asset model that lives in silo in the online or online repositories or some uh, some case even worse in a CD room. So. The first thing I want to highlight about the uh, the, digital, uh, the digital twin is the GIS integration, um, because now we are uh, uh, we're more talking about uh, to jump from a building level to a community level to do the smart community to do the to do the smart the city and we more care about all the underground utilities and make those things also beamized or you you do the the civil 3D, so all of your facilities, your buildings, and your underground utilities, your distribution utilities need to be coordinated and displayed in the same uh, map platform, S3, or some other um, some other um, map system. So here we act, we what we 
uh, does is we uh, we export this map into the JSON file and we give it uh, give it to 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 to, uh, to either the to both the Watson AI services and also the Chrome JS to maximum uh, JS to maximum integration. Here is a lot of possibility, as I mentioned before, you can you, you can achieve through a digital twin. Once you, you apply a digital twin, first you're going to have a model uh, inside of your Maximo. You can just do 3D navigation as you don't need to install any Revit or uh, Navis work, or you don't need to know anything about how to do the Revit ish things because we know you are facility guys, you are not supposed to, to learn Revit or any other software. So it will be a Chrome based web app that you can just do the three D navigation, um, see or uh, click on an asset and see what is the attribute. And also you you can do something more. I'm going to talk about during my Ask Alex uh, session to uh, talk with the uh, AI and ask uh, natural languages like you talk with Siri. Um, and also, digital team can uh, communicate with your artificial intelligence or the AI uh, AI platform. So like uh, all, all, all the data uh, you <clears throat> think crafted during operation maintenance, including your, uh, your uh, on-site collections from your IoT sensors, from your historical data, from all your submissions, your cache sheets, all of these things, can be can supposed to be uh, after your data preparation data massage become the training set for your artificial intelligence to machine learning do the different or all those kind of fancy things i'm going to give you uh, one example later um then i mentioned before the real-time iot sensor because now you have this digital twin and it's a perfect platform to to insert or to adopt all kinds of iot sensors coming from the ibm cloud from uh, coming from the IBM system goes into your Maximum, goes into your IBM Maximum and start to connect to communicate with your either your 3D objects or or connected with your work order or your your service request or something else. Uh, and and of course you have a linked asset management uh, asset management records. All your asset entries will be synchronizing between your digital model, your 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 perfect uh, rabbit model, uh, and your uh, maximal database and all the warranties maintenance manual in PDF format it goes directly uh, with carry through carried by your very model goes into maximal and uh, um, IBM has the uh, services called IBM discovery so actually it's a uh, it's using the RN it's a recurring neural network to understand um, the contents of your manual so you just need to train like uh, several books uh, tell them okay so this section is called installation guide that section is called um, q a that section is called uh, maintenance guide and the later on um, when you are facing a pump leaking or, or something you can just say hey i want to see the maintenance uh, maintenance procedure for this pump and uh, the ai can search through thousands of the pdf and find exactly um, a piece of the paragraph in front of you so that can save you a huge amount of time, believe me. And also, as I mentioned before, the data diction, uh, the digital twin, because it's, uh, it's also SQL database um, or some other database uh, uh, centralized. So all this information can, can connect to Power BI or the tabular or other data analytic and the reporting tools to do your business intelligence. This is the fancy dashboard and uh, um, for some high level decision making uh, assistance. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about Eric. Um, because I just mentioned, I already um, kind of uh, mentioned, uh, uh, start to uh, talk about a lot of fancy um, high structure um, functionality, like short talk about the uh, AI, talk about the visual insight, I talk about the, the digital twins, and now I just want to go to the bottom goes to the very foundation of the entire um, entire asset management or facility ma facility management program build up is the data dictionary um, of your entire um, asset management program. So, Arid is a a web app. Um, it's now it's actually a web app suite we developed for um, for help you to manage and to refine your data dictionary. So ARID is the uh, abbreviation for Asset Registry Information Database. 
So the first thing it does is it, it capture all of your existing data dictionaries um, into a into a cloud-based uh, uh, database and start to do the do the semantic analysis and do the um, um, do all kinds of recommendations and give you a standardized, normalized, and uh, very accurate uh, data dictionary. So, uh, so some of um, some of um, some of examples can be showed up here. This is uh, a a real life example. So we have a very huge um, government agent, agency as our client. Um, they have um, a huge scare data dictionary. They don't use Kobe, uniformat, omniformat, because they also have bridges and tunnels and those kind of things uh, Kobe cannot cover. So they develop their own data dictionary. Um, and uh, they have like a three neighbor system, um, chill water, uh, pop water and also the wastewater. So each system, they are going to put a pump, pump in it. So, uh, but because they develop these three systems separately and uh, they have like a hundred systems in total lives in, in Excel sheets. So there's no way they can just, uh, you know, find a way to eyeball and to do all the data cleanup and uh, to bump up the data in, uh, consistency. So they have a lot of uh, mismatch here. This Place is called the centrifugal. Uh, there's a typo here, and here is called pump centrifugal. This is called centrifugal pumps, and all the attributes are kind of um, messed up. They have the manufacturer, but here is called maker. Their serial number is the word, but here is a symbol. So all kind of uh, things that is very hard for human eyes to capture, and uh, because you are facing huge amount of Excel sheets or some other format, even using Python, using I know the some I understand the packages in Python you can deal with with Excel sheet, but it's still a big project. Um, so that's why we have this um, array to digest all kinds of your Excel sheets, your CV, your CSV into array and uh, um, solve all kinds of these issues. We have four or five different kind of semantic analysis algorithm running 24 by 7 behind of your database and try to punch your database accuracy from different angles. Uh, do you have two things meaning the same thing? Do you have typos? Do you call a centrifugal pump here and they call the pump centrifugal over there? Do you have an acronym missing? Do you have one acronym linked to two assets or two acronyms linked to one asset? So all kind of the, the things you have to solve it as early as possible. And if you don't do it now, in the future, you're going to suffer a lot. Um, so here we use the help of um, the semantic analysis algorithm and also we use the machine learning a little bit to give you recommendations. So here is your local attributes and uh, we have huge amount of uh, clients, um, conf um, confidential um, attributes or some other things online. We, uh, we have security um, uh, consideration of that. So all the, all the client's name will be a wide your, your you only see other client attributes you don't have. So for example, here, uh, you don't have like a um, public facing, you, you don't have data in sort, you don't have, you don't have replacement costs. Those kind of things are important for, um, for a normal uh, master management program. So here, you, what you can do is like YouTube, you can like or unlike some of them and uh, the, the, the ranking of the recommendation for you will be refreshed every time it goes into this particular asset and give you more accurate, um, personalized, personalized recommendation. Um, then Ask Alex. Ask Alex is one of the most uh, exciting projects or the uh, products we have ever built. Um, so uh, I talk about the 3D navigation function in Watson. Uh, in the maximal, and uh, I highlight that you're, you don't need to be, to know how to use Rabbit, but still, you're going to dealing with a huge building. Like if you're a terminal, you're you you're going to see through like a thousands of the um, assets or or thousands of hundreds of components and spare parts, num numberless spare parts. So here, why we don't have a way? We feed the entire model into our AI brain, and we train it, and we say, okay, now you understand the building itself and we give you some uh, some natural language programming functionality. Now you understand some natural language. When each time we ask you a question, like we ask Siri, you can extract the subject, uh, the subject from my sentence 
and understand my question and give me the right answer. So here, for example, you, you can ask, hey, Alex, so show me all the assets with the warranting expiration date within two weeks. So that things will coming from either from your Revit model, because Revit model has way, uh, way more data than, um, than the asset entries in your maximal database, because we only export those assets data and the required asset parameter and attributes into Maximo. But for the, for for uh, maybe 95% of other data, like your dimensions, your uh, your inlet, your outlet, those, those kind of things, if the asset management pro program does not require it, um, traditionally, it's just being dumped into, goes with your asset, um, goes with your asset model into the repository. But now, you can still query through those things. So it gives you tremendous uh, uh, flexibility if you want to get something later. So show me all the assets with higher criticality and under condition three. Show me system supply air A1 and all rooms it impacts. Or here is a good a example. So hey, show me the supply air system connected to room 101. So then the AI on view. Okay, so, okay, so uh, this guy want me to, to first pull up where is room 101 and uh, figure out what is the, the supply air system and find the combination or the intersection of the supply air system and the room 101 and here is the highlighted uh, pipeline or the stack work that I can give you here. So it's by doing this, it gives like um, way more uh, dynamics and flexibility for the facility managers or, or for the facility operators to search for some particular questions. And uh, from here, you can directly create the work orders. You can send it to somebody or you can create uh, some uh, service requests. It's all kind of imaginations. The last thing I want to mention here is about uh, how we can benefit the, the humanitarian application using the uh, machine learning different and other AI functionalities. So <clears throat> here is an example we did for uh, some certain African areas. Those show so they have like a thousand uh, um, um, uh, pump points around their territory. Um, I think it's like 3,000 to something. And uh, for each of them, they they have 30 different kind of parameters. We call that the third, the third dimensions, including who is the installer, who is the manufacturer, is it public facing, what is the head of pressure, what is the water quality, um, what is the population this pump covered, blah, blah, things. And now they try to, because it views, take them a um, huge amount of money <coughs> from the government to send people on site to do the um, on site data collection to check, oh, this pump is functional, that pump is need, need the repair, but it's too functional, and that pump need, need a hot fix. So they, they publish um, a, a huge data space. A data set online said that we are uh, we we want some like uh, some models that help us to predict if I give you only the 30 uh, data input uh, what is the manufacturer blah blah the, the parameter I just mentioned you tell me if this pump is still functional or need repair or I don't need to care about it or I need to send people on site now so uh, this can uh, of course, improve the maintenance operation and uh, ensure that the clean public water and save money for the local government, which is very important. So we know there is a lot of algorithm that George mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that has been derived from the classical, you know, decision tree algorithms. And uh, um, here we we use a couple of it: the XGB or the extreme gradient boosting. Initially, uh, initially started as a research project by uh, I think University of Washington around. 20, 2014 and got its big name around 2000, 2016. So now from that time, people don't use the resin forest at all. They start to change their shoes to the XGB. And the, the, the next year, uh, Microsoft, they released their uh, live GBM, it's or called the Air GBM. And uh, uh, another very popular one, Yandex is from a Russian leading tech company. Uh, have a cat boost. So these three things are the most popular one right now. Um, so you, you can use a lot of different workflows to do the training and testing. I mean, the Python, the R Studio, Google Colab, or Jupyter Notebook, or, or even your local 
IDEs. So the way I uh, we'd like to mention here is using IBM Watson Studio, as George mentioned at the beginning, as our AI-related experiment platform to try out all kinds of ideas. So the user experience is, is very impressive and very smooth and can dramatically speed up. Actually, for my own case, speed up my project from a high level. So, for example, here we use the Adam Watson to run the training data set in, in three um, classifiers. We use the, the random forest, we use the, the RGBM and XGB, and we do each uh, classifier four pipelines, so one, two, three, four pipelines. And um, each, each client will involve different set of feature engineering and optimization iterations. So those are kind of the data, data science um, terminologies, but in general, it, it's just telling you that you can, um, before that we use our, we are all very familiar with how we use Excel to do the, uh, to do the curve, to fit the curve, to do the linear or some other curve fitting. But that's only, it's like one dimensional. You have a X and uh, you want a Y. But if you have X and Y, you want a Z, I don't, I, I, uh, I apologize for my ignorance. I don't know how to do that in Excel or an easy way to do that in Excel. But here we're not talking about two. We, we're not talking about X and Y. We're talking about from A to Z, this amount of parameters, and we want a output sigma. So I don't think <clears throat> human brain can digest that thing. And well, when we talk about the future engineering, it's not only going to use your 30 parameters. It's going to give you more because here it's called new features. So like RGBM and XGB, both of them give you new features um, to to boost up your your uh, your future inventory. So maybe your uh, your population and your water quality, their product or the sign of your, yeah, it's true, the sign of the product uh, times the cosine of the manufacturer or the cosine of the population will come as a, a new future and not the new future will, uh, will be dramatically, will dramatically impact your final result and accuracy. So that's why we call that we need different iterations for different future en engineering in order to achieve the maximum accuracy. and. Uh, Without the AI brains, we cannot do this. Um, it's uh, it's just the, the, the basically the limitation of our brain. So here is a quick example that see the tangent GPS height and the tangent of sub village are actually two important new features that the our AI system um, derive from the raw data set. So for this case, we decided to use the XGB as a final classifier and build our model and the implementation around it. It is well known that XGB can be really time consuming, they really, really time consuming and really um, kind of eating up your, um, eating up your, oh, I don't know why this thing goes back, eating up your uh, computer hardware, but uh, um, that's why we, we want to highlight that. We, we strongly recommend to use a cloud-based computational power like Watson AI or the IBM Watson Studio at the first place. So the result of the prediction goes up to like 81% and almost tied to the top score on the ladder. So if you heard about the Kaggle or other data analysis uh, computation website, this is exactly the same thing, but from the, a nonprofit uh, humanitarian perspective. So I'm going to uh, quickly conclude from here, just think a little bit further from this point and a little bit out of the scope of the human experience scope, but that ACO, ACO industry generates millions of millions of data every day. We're supposed to be the one of the largest data, um, data generator of the entire market. And we have this data from on-site connections, from IoT sensor, from historical data, from all kinds of sub submissions. The power of um, uh, the machine learning or different can easily be adapted into predictive maintenance, digital twins, as we mentioned before, to change the way we're doing now for planning, budgeting, result, uh, or even human, or, or the good resources allocation, and so on. So now I'm going to give the back to George and do the final session. Jeff. So really, I mean, every, you know, everything we've, we've been talking to you guys here is, um, you know, AI is is a powerful tool. It can help you 
understand many, many dimensions of data. Um, it can form new dimensions of data for you based upon um, the, the information that it's looking at. And so when we look at the, the journey, you know, that people take, you know, operational for cost reduction and modernization, insight driven, and ultimately, you know, transforming their, their business. Um, most people are right in the middle, you know, between modernization and starting to dabble into insight driven. Um, the question is for the group here, you know, where are you in your, in your AI journey? Um, we can certainly help you with that. Uh, we have the team, the services, the capabilities to help you with uh, all of your AI needs. And so with that, I would like to open it up for any questions that the group might have in the few minutes that we have remaining. And again, if you go to the questions in your uh, in the, the console, you can type in your question there. Okay. Well, I think we're, you know, we're right at the top of the hour here. So, um, if there are no questions. Just want to say thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and stay safe.